house of the Lord this morning, isn't it? Won't you just turn and greet your neighbor, welcome each and every one of them here this morning. Glad to have each and every one of you, our visitors, everyone that's tuning in by the way of the internet. We thank you for joining us this morning. Amen. Let's sing that song, I'm on my way to Canaan's land. Hallelujah. Are you on your way this morning to a heavenly home? Well, I'm on my way to Canaan's land. Well, I'm on my way to Canaan's land. Sister, don't go. They won't hinder me. And if the church don't go, it won't hinder me. I'm on my way, praise God. I'm on my way. Well, I'm on my way to Canaan's land. I'm on same spirit that raised it's just the way we do it here you know if it don't work it don't work we try if that same spirit that raised christ from the dead dwell in you it dwelled in you oh if that same spirit that raised christ from the dead dwell in you it dwelled in you oh it shall bring
the Lord a hand clap of praise. One of these days, it'll quicken each and every one of our bodies. Who am I? Let's go deep. Who am I that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt? Bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever wandering heart. And not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Donnie Nicholson, after the effects of that stroke, that God would just touch his body and heal him. Also, want to remember our pastor, that God would just strengthen him this morning, and also the appointments upcoming this week. Just pray for him there. Also, our sister Denise Shiflett, that God would just continue to just touch her body and strengthen her. Is she here this morning? Amen. Hey, give her a hand clap of praise this morning. Hallelujah. Glad to have her here. Amen. She's had a battle on her hands, but we know the Lord is on our side. Amen. So just continue to lift her up in our prayers that God would touch her. Also want to remember Sister Judy Archer that is fighting cancer. That is Brother Daryl Ward's sister. I want to remember Brother Roger and Sister Ann Saylor. Also our Sister June Shiflett. I want to continue to lift up Brother Gene Gordon. Remember him and Sister Tanya in our prayer. Brother Gene is off the ventilator and the echo machine. 
that was oxidating his blood. However, he is having some issues with his lungs not wanting to expand as much as normal, and his kidneys haven't woken up yet from being sedated so long. We're believing that all will come back in working order. So just be remembering them and the church there, Brother Joe Green's there. Also want to remember Sister Rexanne Green this morning that God would touch her. I think she had a fall this morning. So I want to pray for her. Sister Deborah Watson has asked us to lift up her cousin Becky that has been diagnosed with liver cancer. So remember her. Also our sister Charlene Noel and uh, Brother Jim there. She had a procedure this week, so remember them. I uh, want to remember Faith Miller and the family as they're having some sinus infections and dealing with things of that order. Also, Bonnie Sumpner's daughter, she's in the hospital with double pneumonia. Her name is Dana Sumpner, so I want to remember her. Also, I want to lift up Sister Barbara Gregory's grandson, Charlie. He has some things going on with his liver, so I want to remember them and all the procedures there. Sister Terry Props has asked us to lift up an unspoken request that she needs God to move on this morning. How many would have an unspoken request you'd like to lift up to the Lord also this morning? We know our God can see and meet each and every one of these needs, don't we? I'm going to ask for Brother William Borlevon just pray over these for us this morning. Amen. Let's bow our heads and our heart and speak to our Heavenly Father. Dear gracious Lord Jesus, we Thank you, Father, for this opportunity, Lord, to become and gather together, Lord, around your unchanging word, Father, Lord, the tree of life, Father. And, Lord, the tree of life is nothing else than our Lord Jesus Christ. And, Lord, your children many, many, many years ago, Father, because of doubting one word, Father, Lord, were, had to leave a perfect Eden that you had prepared for them, a place of fellowship, a place where you could come down and fellowship with your children but lord through the deceitfulness of sin separation had come and they had to leave that perfection father but lord you would not leave your masterpiece laying there but father you came down in the form of body lord of human flesh in a perfect body oh god to provide a perfect redemption for your children and lord now oh god the the cherubims lord jesus are calling back to come back to that tree of life where fellowship has been restored. All because of the precious blood of Jesus Christ that has been shed, that has made the way back, oh God, that you can come down, oh God, and fellowship with your children, oh God. Lord, what a thought, oh God, that to meditate upon it is simply staggering, oh God, that you would not leave us, Lord. You would not allow yourself to be separated from us. Lord. You would not allow us to be separated from you, but you came. And now you're calling, oh God, through the voice of your word to come back unto you. Lord, when you were here in a body of clay, you even spoke these words. Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Lord, you've been calling out, Lord, to the nation of Israel, oh God, for so many years. And then you blinded your own children, oh God, to turn to heathenistic Gentiles that had no thoughts towards you. Oh, God, how far your love reaches to a people that have no thought towards you and you would blind your own children to turn your holy face to lost Gentiles. And out of these lost Gentiles, Father, you called out for seven church ages. You called out through seven messengers because you wanted a bride. Because in the back part of your mind, you yearned, oh, God, for fellowship, Father. And Lord, your word is called out a bride and each successive age. And here we are at the end time, oh God, the last of the last, the last runners of this race. Father, how we love you, Lord. We thank you for this open book, Lord, that allows us to see from where we are now and to see modern events made clear by prophecy. To look through your word, oh God, and look all the way in the back part of your mind. Lord, we can never thank you enough. We just worship you, Lord, and we lift you up on high. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that... You would give us ears to hear, and you predestinated us to hear this word. Father God, we lift up these requests to you, Lord. Lord, many storms of life come, Father Lord, and they come in different ways. But you, Lord, you're just in our boat. It doesn't matter, Father. Your presence is with us. Things may not always go like we expect, 
But Lord, one thing that never changes is that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. No matter the storms of life, Father, you promise to never leave us or forsake us. So, Lord, we commit these requests into your hands. And Brother Gene, Lord, Sister Rexanne, and Lord, we thank you for what you brought Sister Denise through, Lord. And all the requests, Father, Lord, that was read across here, Father, Lord, in each hand that was raised. We ask, oh God, that you turn your tender eyes of mercy toward every request. Heal the sick. Save the lost. Fill with the Holy Ghost this morning. Father, we ask you to touch your servant, our dear pastor, Brother Ron. Lord, give him strength in his body. Lord, we pray you give him a special touch. Give us a special touch, and we'll, in return, give you all the praise, honor, and glory. We love you now. We commit this service into your hands. Have your way with us, we pray. We submit ourselves to you. We humble ourselves to you even now. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Isn't good to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. We're going to receive this morning's offering you give as God's bless you. I'll ask our brother Marcus turn if he'd come sing for us this morning, if he would. And then after he will have Sister Emily Huffman come sing for us. Amen. Just want to make a quick note. We're having our uh, project that's done in the back. And uh, we thank you for bearing with us and all the ones that's taking part in that. Uh, but there's been many uh, through the internet that has asked about donations. So I just want to make this uh, announcement here. If you would like to make that donation, just send a check or make contact with Brother Ron or myself, and we'll make arrangements for that. It's just through the Full Gospel Lighthouse Tabernacle there. So we thank you for all the giving there and many that's already reached out, so we appreciate that. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated after you've given. too far to look back my feet have walked through the valleys I've climbed mountains crossed rivers oh desert places I've known
I was lost in shame, could not get past my blame until he called my name. I'm so glad he changed me, darkness held me down, but Jesus pulled me out and I'm no longer bound. I'm so glad he changed me, see I'm now a
of the Lord this morning. Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad you know who you are in Christ Jesus? Amen. Amen. Let's stand this morning and prepare our hearts for the preaching of the word this morning. And just want to make mention to you that uh, next weekend we're going to be having Brother Jason Jackson coming and speaking for us next weekend. So I, I know that you'll enjoy that. So just be remembering Brother Jason. He'll be coming in and and uh, we, we certainly love Brother Jason here, so we're just looking to a good time in the Lord. Blessed assurance, oh, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, well, time after time. Stop. 
God. Amen. Won't you greet somebody there near you? So good to have each and every one of you in the house of the Lord this morning. And we got the memo, Brother Johnny. We got the memo. So good to see each and every one of you, Brother Johnny. Good to see you, each and every one of you this morning. Our friends from West Virginia, God bless you. Amen. Amen. Introduce yourself there. Amen. We're sure glad to have you in the house of the Lord. God bless you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Isn't it good to us? Amen. It's your first time here this morning. Just raise your hand. So glad to have you with us. Amen. We love you with everything that's within us. We, we sure we sure are pleased with, to see you today. Pleased to be seen, and 
and uh, we're so thankful for what God is doing. You know, if you want your, ho- your home remodeled in a week, call Ray. <laughs> I, was, I was in a, I was thinking this morning, Brother Ray, I was in a steamboat hotel. And I said, Connie, I had a vision. She said, what do you have? And I said, well, I saw a vision that we had glass doors, glass, wood glass doors all the way across the back end. And she said, Really? I said, yeah. She said, I don't know how that'll look. I said, well, I I got to see it. (laughs) So I relate it to Brother Ray. Be careful what you relate to Brother Ray. He said, we can make that happen. He said, you want it temporary or want it to be there forever? And I said, "Uh, you know, we've made some decisions and there it is. That's phase one. Can you imagine what two and three is going to be like? And so... Who are we doing that for? You. Amen. That's right. Now tell your neighbor, they're doing all that for you. Amen. Amen. I've got a few pictures of everybody that has been working on that, but you just raise your hands. I want to thank you. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Amen. I've got... I got a lot of pictures with you boys working and smiling the whole time. You guys must have had a good time, so <laughs> amen. Brother Tom told me that we, we couldn't find the squares for the floor. And finally, they found them, and, and Brother Tom, we, we thought we were going to have to order more, and Brother Tom said it worked out exactly right. Amen. amen. That's a miracle. You were sweating, I'm sure, too, so, <laughs> so we're thankful. We're so thankful. And I believe you'll like it. I believe you'll enjoy it. And uh, a lot of things are going on here. So we're so glad to have you with us, a part of all of that. We're looking forward to having Brother Jason Jackson with us next week. And so for those that know Brother Jason Jackson, uh, you love him. He's an incredible friend of ours. And I, I was... I was on a treadmill the other morning, and I was just thinking about him. I just had him so much on my heart, and he began to text me because all of the tests that have went on and then the tests that I have this week, and remember us in that, we got tests every day this week, and so pray for us during that. Tuesday, we have the cancer eye team. They'll be looking, and, and so, so anyway, he was just texting backwards and forwards. I said, can you come this weekend? He said, no, I can't come this weekend, but I can come next weekend. And I said, well, hey, well, let's make that happen. And so, hey, amen, they're going to get on one of those birds and fly over here. And so we're looking forward to seeing that. And so we love them. Then a couple of weeks later, have you relayed this yet? A while back. Brother Tom Ray, he, he's never been here to preach. It's Brother Biscoe's son-in-law. And Brother Michael Ray, who I have a very much an attachment to, amen. he's going to be here to preach and we're looking forward to having them on Saturday and Sunday in a couple of weeks. And so we're looking forward to that. Amen. Then we've got youth camp in Louisiana that's coming up. After that, then we've got Brother Sean Martin's meeting. And we'll be speaking there, I assume, on Saturday night. That's the last thing I heard. And so, Brother Sean, if you're watching, you can correct me on that. And we will not have service on Saturday night. We'll come back on Sunday morning and have service. And so you that enjoy doing that, how many enjoy doing that? So that's a tent meeting that takes us back on a lot of old times. And we'll share more about that as we we go. Amen. Isn't he good to us? He's so wonderful to us. And we love you with all of our hearts. If you'll turn with me to John chapter 1 and verse 1 this morning. John 1 and verse 1. When I go in to have a MRI or a scan to where it's going to take quite a bit of time, there's also a tube that they put me in that sometimes takes quite a long time, and, and they'll put headphones on me. And so when they put headphones on me, they'll ask me, said, what do you want to listen to? And I said, and I'll tell them, symphony piano. Really? Really? And they'll come back and they'll open the things up. And she said, 
Did I hear you say that right? Symphony piano? Yes, yes, that's what I'd like to hear. So the last time I had it, the girl that was taking care of me, she said, we never have that request only with you. <laughs> so today I want to speak on God's symphony. Amen. Will that be okay? Amen. Amen. John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's quite a statement, isn't it? The same was in the beginning with God. Notice these next words. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. It's quite a statement, isn't it? I want you to read that last verse with me. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So that means you're pretty important. Amen. Amen. Maybe of a need you'd like to say, would you come by, Lord, and touch me today. Heavenly Father, we love you today with all of our hearts. We thank you for the strength to stand here and Speak to the bride of Jesus Christ, and what a lovely group. We ask you that you would just sweep across this audience, anoint the gift in our lives, and anoint the gift in their lives. And Lord, may we just come into fellowship with you and become very much aware that you're here. Now, we have needs. All of us do. All of us have a different needs. All of us are going through different things. And I ask you that you would help us today. Lord, we thank you for what Brother Ray and his team are doing here. I, I just cannot imagine in my mind's mind when you get all of the men like them together in that millennium, what will be accomplished. I ask you that you would help us, dear God, today. Strengthen us in a special way, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen and amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I want to just kind of ramble just for a moment if it would be okay. Amen. This week something very special happened and I've given it a lot of thought. Sister Chastity had, um, had been adopted. Is this okay to tell? I'm going to anyway. <laughs> Sister Chastity had been adopted into a wonderful family and I'm talking about wonderful family. They were t she was taken care of by angels. And so uh, they were deeply loved. We loved them personally. Sister Denise, good to see you, girl. Good to have you back. And Sister Chastity got, got word, and I, was it a week or so? A couple. She got a call, and they began to ask her, this man began to ask her, what was her name? kind of some background. He said, I think of your brother. And we have a sister. And so you got to meet them. I saw the pictures. And so when I saw the picture, I, I said, that's definitely, I, I'm sorry about the sister, but I said, that's definitely from the same bull. That's what I said. And as I begin to think about this, now I want to bring every one of you into this. I've been in China. I've been all over Europe. I've been throughout the Caribbean. I've been in a lot of places. I've been in New Zealand, Australia, a lot of places, all over Canada. And when I meet somebody for the first time, I believe I can say this for you, there's just a, an attachment. You don't know why, you can't describe it, but you feel like you found a part of yourself. Maybe for decades, we haven't had this conversation, so I'm just going to move in. And so for decades, you found yourself kind of missing a part of you. And in just a matter of minutes, a lot of questions are answered, and that's by, not by having a conversation, but by that like spirit. 
So when I get off of a plane, and there's hundreds of people that are there, I got off a plane in, in Nashville one time, and, and there was a girl that got on, and she was, had a bodyguard that was with her, and she got on the plane, and she sat down beside of me. She never said hello. She curled up, put the belt on, and she curled up and went to sleep immediately. And when got off, there was flowers on the floor and roses everywhere. And there was a big placard. It wasn't for me. <laughs> it was for the girl that sat beside of me. And I didn't know I was sitting beside of a celebrity. And, uh, and she was getting ready to get a Grammy Award that night. And, and there was limousines waiting outside and all of that different kind of thing. And I come to find out, you know, I rode with Taylor Swift. I had no idea. I didn't know who she was. And she was a teenage phenomenon. And I, I, didn't, I never heard her music. Matter of fact, I still haven't heard her music. <laughs> and you know what? Meeting her didn't mean too much to me. But I walked around the corner and there was a brother that said, Brother Ron. And in a moment, I felt that family feeling. In a moment. We were driving down out of service uh, maybe a few months ago. And, and you guys had stopped on the side of the hill and I said, Connie, go back. Go back. They're, they're real believers. Go back. They're part of our family. I want to shake their hands. I, I want to tell them thank you for coming. Brother and Sister Seabreeze. Let me just say this to you. We came from God. We came from God. And we're going to go back to God. And we're family here. And we're family all over the world. Now, many of them are different than what we are. Some are noisy, and some are quiet, and some are this way or some are that way. But we all came from God. We all came from God. And we get around one another, and after a little while, we begin to discover that God-likeness about us all. Now, it's that humanity that we sometimes have difficulty with. And, but we realize that we are... God has placed something to reflect like a star in our lives and we're reflections of him. When we first begin to serve the Lord, we'll, we'll, we'll discover more about ourselves. And you know, in the world, we, we couldn't get satisfied. Sin just couldn't satisfy us. But it's just like when you serve God, God just so fills you up and, and he fills you up and he fills you up and, and you want to be back in service and you want to be with one another. An enemy will try to drive uh, 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 a vice between one another because he knows together we're stronger. Together we're stronger. So whether it's a family or whether it's a church or where it's a multi-membered across the world, it is Satan that tries to draw something between you because he knows together, together. Sure, there'll always be differences, but together, when you can get those, that difference out of the way, I'm drawn from a background when I was about 18 years old and I was a senior, probably 17 at that time. And I was in a, I was, I was selected to be a special, special part of the school or the county that where we was in. And it was two from every school and I was selected to be one of them. And they took us to Washington. They did that on a few different kind of times and, and then some of them call it governor school or whatever, but they, they took us to Washington and and on both occasions, they, they took us to an orchestra. And it was the national orchestra that was played. And I didn't know much about it. But one time that we went there, and they were playing Peter and the Wolf. 
You ever hear Brother Branham talk about Peter and the wolf? And, and they were playing this orchestra. I'm a country boy. I've been raised on a farm. I'm in a class of 33 people. And, uh, you know, and so anyway, they take us there, and then they move us to another place. It's a theater. And in that theater, I'll never forget it, it was a, these things kind of stick in my mind. It was a, it was a theatrical event. And it was an event called Much Ado About Nothing. And I thought, what in the world? Why am I sitting here? And then the next theater was about the great renaissance. And so that was, that was, that was quite an interesting thing. But, but I thought, what will I need in my life to know about Much Ado About Nothing? Actually, there was a TV series that came out many years later, called Seinfeld. And it was much ado about nothing. <laughs> much ado about nothing. And I think sometimes as Christians, the enemy gets our eyes focused on That's right. much ado about nothing. <laughs> I've often asked myself the question, and so here we go. I've often asked myself the question, what was I doing watching a symphony? On a couple of different occasions. I'm 62 years old now. One of my pastimes and one of the things that I do to go to sleep is I listen to symphony. And you go, Brother Ron, but you're a country guy. Yeah, but there's something on the inside of me that just kind of likes that. And then when I begin to study the message and, and I begin to realize Brother Branham is preaching in Yuma, Arizona, or he's preaching or in California, or he's preaching over here in, in Canada, and, and he's preaching all over the world, whether it's in Finland or whether it's in Switzerland or in, definitely in Jeffersonville or wherever he's preaching, all of those sermons are linked together. And it's kind of like the Bible, 40 different writers, none of them would hardly know one another, but they were all inspired by the same writer. And it would each one complement one another. And Brother Branham would say in Christ the Mystery of God and also other sermons, he'd say, if you can't read Jesus Christ in every scripture, Read it again. And so when I begin to look at the services that we are involved in, and many times our services here are like a convention service, and every one of them is linked one to another. And every one of them, if you'll pay close attention, has got a part for you inside of that service. It's not a man that's doing any of that. It's God that is doing that. Maybe I'll get to it again, and I was just re-looking at some of these things, but I was looking at a, a sermon that I preached before cancer, and it says, the hurt cannot hurt the music. Amen. The hurt that you're going through will not stop the music that you have. So I can look at it standing on this side four years later and say, all of the hurt that we have went through with cancer has not deterred the music of our lives. Now, if you remember, there's a few things that I want to drop to you. Brother Branham in the vision of the, the bride coming into preview. And then the last one he was watching, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stay on the bride, not the church world. But in the, as they begin to march as ladies and they're going forward, and he was so pleased to see how that they were marching. One in the back kind of, kind of got out of step. And he began to scream, get back in line. Get back in line. Get back in step. They were marching and he would sing the song many times in his ministries, Onward Christian Soldiers. Let me just say this to you, all of us, whether it's in Brother Branham's meetings, the mighty angel came down to this bride of Jesus Christ. That, that angel's still here among us. We're under the influence of that mighty angel. 
Now, let me just say, every one of us have to surrender our ambition to God. Brother Bram will use a sermon called Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He would surrender himself. Now, as a Christian, we no longer want our own will because our will and our choices took us away from God. And we realize that our, our choices took us out in the world and did a lot of different things. But by predestination and the election and the adoption of God, God comes in. And I, I, I don't know if you're at this stage yet or not, but maybe when you were younger, it felt like don't do, don't do, don't do. You must not do. You must do this. You must do that. And it was almost somebody like a, somebody beating you with a hammer. But if you ever fall in love with God, you don't want to do anything that's wrong. You just want to be right. You just want to love him. You just want to please him. You, want to, you just want to be a part of his program. Whether he's at, that's where I want to be. Jesus would even pray this, and I'll, I'll share this with you. And after this manner, therefore pray you, our Father, which art in heaven, Matthew chapter six and verse nine. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let's read it together. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Brother Stephen, he prayed, not my will, but thy will be done. He could have had a family. He could have had a church. He could have had the kingdom himself. He was offered the United States. He could have had all of those things because the king of this world was offering it to him. But you was on his mind. Brother Vernon, down through time, six church ages, you was on his mind. Seven church ages, you was on his mind. 6,000 years, he's looking down through, looking at time, seeing you. If he takes his own will, he loses you. Now notice, just for a basis, Brother Bram said, his word it's like a great symphony. And how many of you ever, ever heard of a symphony? You know, when I begin to study the message, I went, Brother Branham? A symphony? And he says, well, everybody has. Now, remember, a symphony is when music is played in a drama. I think I have it right, a symphony. Peter and the Wolf. And you remember that the old story, how they used to, I've heard that, how that they would take the drums and make the little woodpecker pecking. And Peter going out and the growling of the wolf and the tooting of the horns, a, a symphony. Notice how he begins to just bring us all into it. He says, now if you don't understand a symphony, it's a big bunch of racket to you. I said, Brother Ron, I'd just rather hear some bluegrass. Well, isn't it great that God made us all different? Amen. Now, you've got to understand what it is. It's all done by signs and motion. But it acts like a drama in the symphony. And we notice the only one that understands a symphony is the composer. And those who are interested in knowing it knows its changes knows what is taking place. Now, the composer knows every move, move from the end to the beginning. He's the one who writes it. And he says, he said, he, he said, the one who wrote it up, he composes it. And he knows every little junction. And it's important that you get the junctions right. And if he knows every junction... So does the director. The director has to know every move. 
He said to direct it. He says, now, how are you going to twist a creed or, or one little miscue of a stick and a sign and one little miss sign at a junction would throw the whole orchestra off? He said, throw the whole symphony out. He said, now, you know that's true. The composer and the director has to be in the same spirit. Are you with me? Now let's just lay out some, let's just lay out some basics here. Now the director that is going to direct maybe the national orchestra, he has to pick a piece that he's inspired by. Now whether it's Bach or Beethoven or any of the other great composers of history, they have a, they have a way that they want this played. And the director, when he chooses a part, and he chooses maybe a, an hour or two hour pieces to do, he doesn't have a right to misinterpret it. He doesn't have a right to rewrite it. He has to keep it in the spirit of the way it's written. There's a way that it's got to sound. There's a way that it's got to be done. And so he begins with the music. And he begins to pick the greatest musicians in the world to play the part. And, and then the music or the instruments that they're playing, they're not just some 10 cent piece. They are the best pieces of horn or violin or flute or the drum. They just don't go get yard sale pieces. But they begin to bring, and, and every one of those musicians, every one of them are gifted in life to be able to bring the best out of that instrument. They're gifted in a certain way, maybe some by a learned experience, but most likely most of them have a gift that they were born in on the inside of their hearts, like an artist or a poetry writer or like a real bride of Jesus Christ. Now, these instruments being of the highest quality, they've got to be taken care of. And these men that, that are gifted to be able to play, ladies being able to play, when they play the music, they begin to bring that music to life. Maybe that music is 400 years old, but it's still a masterpiece. So now just laying in book form, it'll lay dormant. But if they can take their, their part and they can realize I've got a part to play in this and they begin to bring that 400, that 400 year old music and bring it forward. Are you with me? They begin to bring it forward. Now listen, a masterpiece is actually a piece of a, of a composer's life. He's actually poured his life in it. No doubt he'll write thousands of pieces of music and be known for one. It's like a preacher or like a songwriter or like a, a singer. Many times great singers only produce one number one hit. Many preachers when they begin to preach, they'll preach thousands of sermons, but there'll be one that will be elevated. Even Brother Branham will call the token his masterpiece. So you understand kind of where I'm saying right there. Now, when that person is beginning to bring this mu music forward, they're bringing a gift on display. Sorry, I'm just taking it just a bit. Now, whether you're an organ player or whether you're a guitar player or whether you're a drum player, 
You're expressing a gift that is with, from inside of you. <laughs> a preacher, whether you preach to the nursing home or you preach conventions, that's really not your gift. That's God's gift in you. Are you with me? Now, whether it was Abraham or Noah or Elijah or Nahum or even David, when God began to write about their lives, you know, God was quite wonderful in some of those places he wrote about their negative part. Or we would think we had to be angels. Can you imagine how difficult it was for Moses to write about himself having a high temper? Chastity, when you met your brother the other day, you didn't walk up to him in the first two minutes and go, well, there's some things that you're not going to like about me. One's my husband. Whether it was Joseph or David or Tamar or Ruth, they were all displaying a part of God. And your life, whether you realize or not, living right now in 2024, you are actually displaying a part of God. Are you with me? You're more than just a name. You're Christ on display. Well, Brother Ron, I'm, I'm six years old. But you're Christ on display as a six-year-old. As a teenager, you young ladies that are sitting here, young men that are sitting here, you're Christ at your age. You're not a preacher or some, some singer somewhere or another, but you're Christ in school. You're Christ on the job. You're Christ with your friends. Are you with me now? We're instructed that we can't add to it or we can't take away from it. We're instructed that we must keep the word pure and keep it holy and keep our lives that way. I begin to look at some practices of procedures about, about, about symphonies and the organizations of symphonies. And, and to be a part of it, and Sister Cassie, you're welcome to correct me if you, if you would like to do that. But... If there is a vacancy in the National Symphony and they put forward that we need a, a pianist and, and so what they do is they begin to send out word throughout the world. We would like to have a, a pianist. We'd like to have a certain pianist. And, and what they do is, is they have blind auditions. And in the blind auditions, Brother Jordan, you're ahead of me. Stay with me. And in the blind auditions, they don't want to see your face. And they don't want to know who you are. They don't want the appearance of your humanity to affect their decision of who can play the music the best. And you will compete with thousands of people whether you know it or not. So you have to make sure that you and the music are one. That you and the music are one. So when I hear, I'll just use it like this. When I hear Cassie play, it isn't Cassie's opinion of the piece. Or her theory of the piece. It's the piece. And Cassie are one. Brother Brandon went to see, uh, and this might sound uh, kind of new to you. But Brother Random went to see the Ten Commandments 11 times. Because he didn't go to see Charleston Heston. He went to see Charleston Heston had so laid himself aside until now Charleston Heston was not himself anymore. But now he's Moses. So when he steps out there against the Red Sea, it's not Charleston Heston, it's Moses. 
And this little known fact, but Charleston Heston, after the Moses was finished and the work was done and it was complete, Charleston Heston didn't know who Charleston Heston was. He had so stepped into the role. Ron, stay in head. Stay, 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 stay quiet for a minute. Charleston Heston had so stepped into the role. He wasn't even himself anymore. He was Moses. And so he had to go to a facility to get himself called back to find out who he was so he could disattach himself from Moses. You like that? You like that? So let's build a little bit more before we go too much further. So each one of these individuals' life. So let's just say that Cassie wins the part. So Sister Cassie would be going to the National Orchestra and she would begin to play. Now, 300 people is what I understand. About 300 people are playing. Cassie's not over top of all the 300 people. She is complimentary to the rest of them. Now, Cassie's got to find her place in the part. She's got to find her place. Now, it's phenomenal. She's now been selected. But now she's got to find her place and her position. Now, they don't all get together 365 days a year to practice. So they've got to find the work that has been selected and they send the part. And you've got to do that at home. Now, to be a concert pianist, you got to practice. Even with your husband is doing turkey calling in the other room. And so she has to live. That actually happened here, folks. Because he wanted to make sure he sounded like a turkey. And so she literally throws herself into the music. And listen, that don't happen in five minutes. There's no quick fixes. Stay with me. There's no quick fixes here. You just don't walk into church and sit down and all of a sudden you're bride material. There's a lot of work. You got to get yourself out of the way. And Cassie has to figure out, sitting at that piano, I dare not touch it. But she has to figure out, I've got to make this music live. I've got to make it live. I've got to make it sound like it's supposed to sound. When he wrote it down, whether it's Beethoven or Bach or any of the others, when they wrote it, they had a certain thought in their mind that it would sound this certain way. She has no right to rewrite it. Well, this note would sound better. Maybe Bob Tarrant. Maybe Trinity. She doesn't have a right to, to write anything there of her own self. And she's got to make sure that when she plays that people are not here in Cassie. They're not hearing Cassie, but they're hearing Beethoven live. Is this okay? I, I didn't disappoint you. I didn't, I didn't play. Now, a symphony is more than just one person. Now, all the one, the one person fulfillments has already happened. In William Branham. There's no more prophets coming, and there's no more great men coming. And we're not looking for the next mister. We're not building kingdoms here. We're expanding so your children can sit here when they get 21. 
Look around. These little guys are going to be married and they're going to be having babies and it'll happen quick. So I can't just look at you now. I got to look at you. Whether I'm here or whether I'm not here, I got a plan. So when I, when I got a dining room table, I, brother Connie told me, she said, that's too big. That's too big. It's got 18 chairs. Yeah. Yeah, I, I need, we're going to need a big table. Well, she was thinking about Matthew, Andrew, and Whitney. And then there come a stinking guy. And then there came girls. Amen. And then there came babies. Amen. And now the table's full. Amen. And now we set out other tables and set out chairs. That's what we're doing here. Amen. We're going to need a bigger table here. Once again, you can correct me. It's me and Cassie having a per- sermon this week. She didn't know it, and here we are. Now, a, a symphony is made up of four different sections or four different movements. Now, each movement has its own structure and its own format. The first, you may have to help me say some of these names. The first uses a quick tempo. It's setting the pace. And I'm not going to even attempt to say the word that goes behind it. But it's, it uses a sonata and an A-L-L-E-G-R-O. Allegro. I should have known that. I took Allegra. <laughs> Has nothing to do with Allegro. You've been here for a month or two. We're really glad to have you. But you've already figured out by now, I don't have a Ph.D. degree here. (laughs) Now, the second movement is slower and more lyrical because it's a more of a feeling type of music. And I'm not going to call out because i got a great big list here. I'm not going to call out all of the, the pieces of music that is feeling the second movement. Or even the third movement is a minuet. Or S-C-H-E-R-Z-O. Scherzo. 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 Don't that sound? Scherzo. (laughs) And the final movement often uses a sonata or an allegro. It went well that time, didn't it? (laughs) Now, all of these make up a symphony. Now, in each every one of them, there are leaders. And there's, I'll just use one, there's, there's what they call the first chair. And the first chair is the lead musician, maybe to a certain set of horns. All of them are playing the same type of horns. But the first chair, he's there because he is the best. And he can make that music come alive. Now then there, what I've read, and I've done my best, but there can be as many as 10 that are actually right in with him playing the same piece of music and the same instrument. But none of them have the right to take the other one's place. None of them have the right to go off on their own. None of them have the right to interpret the music in their own way. One might come from France and another come from Nigeria. But they're playing the same music. They're playing the same music. Whether it's Bach, Beethoven, or the message of the hour. Everyone has a responsibility to subdue themselves. I've got it written right here. To subdue themselves and become a prisoner. 
to the position whether it ate a hamburger or a hot dog or an egg salad sandwich that morning, it doesn't have anything to do once they sit down. There is a dress code. There is a dress code. And this says it right here. For, for 99%, it's called tuxedo for a man. And formal ladies wear and it says that dress is for the women. That's not a yard sale dress. And that's not a yard sale tuxedo. I began to go and take a look at just how much some of these individuals had to spend just to dress a certain part. And listen, their part in the entire symphony may not cover that Or it might be that big. But you're still a part. Are you with me now? You say, well, Brother Ron, especially when you're young in the, in the message and you're just coming in, what's the important part about dress wear? You're presenting Jesus Christ. And if he wants me to dress a certain way, I want to dress a certain way. And then it has to do not just with dress wear, but it has to do with attitude. Can I just, can I just read one of the number one rules? Leave your arrogance at the door. Let's give the Lord a big hand right there. Well, if, I hope that didn't hurt your feelings. But this ain't about you. I want to tell you this church is not about me. I'm only a musician here. Brother Jim's working at my house. He comes, he comes by my office. He says, what are you doing? I said, I'm working. It don't look like a preacher's working when he's sitting reading. But He's working. Because he got to get himself out of the way. And when you get yourself out of the way, it isn't about you. It's about him. And you want to make sure your front sight and your back sight is exactly lined up so you can hit the target. It's got to be on the mark. And as a minister, not only has it got to be on the mark, you got to have the right attitude. Cause a minister in a bad attitude will cause every one of you agitated. You come in, you're wanting to be moved by the Holy Spirit. You're wanting to be motivated so you can take on next week. But if that man of God, regardless of who he is, if he hasn't got his stuff out of the way, are you with me? Let me just use myself for example. Let me just say, some weeks I have difficult weeks. Some weeks I have bad days. Some days I have good days. Some mornings I'll get up on Sunday morning to preach and I'll feel absolutely horrible wanting to go back to bed. You don't need to hear all of that. that. I tell you some of those things so you'll pray for me. But let me just say this to you. That should not affect the music. Because God's greater than cancer. God's greater than your problems. You mind if I just go through some of the, the rules for getting ready? Arrive early. You think it, that was for church? Come prepared. Have music responsibility. Be courteous to your colleagues. 
Be courteous to your colleagues. I'm talking to the people on the internet. Be courteous to your colleagues. All of you work jobs and you've, when somebody walked through the door and shut the door, you know what kind of attitude that they were in. How many of you had one of them in your life? Hopefully it's not your wife. (laughs) Don't tune your instrument too loudly. Don't chat. Don't tune your instrument too loudly. You can answer it, it's fine. Don't chat. Well, Brother Ron, I, I, I've been playing music with this guy for 10 years. Listen, we came for a symphony, not to talk about your tomatoes. If you're using a, it's here. If you're using a bow instrument, don't hit the person beside you. (laughs) Know who your leader is. Don't try to outdo them. You know, this one must have been important. Leave your arrogance at the door. This is not the place to tell your life story. The mission of the symphony is to bring the music piece to life. Hallelujah. Now you can breathe deep. It's going to be okay now. I've laid out the foundation. Brother Bram said when Jesus, when he was on earth, they couldn't understand his ministry. It was too great. It was a phenomena. They just couldn't. A phenomena. He said they couldn't understand him. But he said, search the scriptures. Search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they. The sheet mucus is telling you. I'm he. The scripture is telling you. I'm fulfilling the part. Let me just go out on a limb. The scriptures is telling you. That I am the bride of Jesus Christ. This is our time. This is our life. God allotted the word, and he said that day was to be the manifestation of God, God Emmanuel with us. His name shall be called Wonderful and Counselor, the Prince of Peace, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. And God was in David, and God was in Moses, And and that's God all the way through manifesting himself for the age. But this age, a virgin shall conceive and shall bring forth a son. And he will be God with us. Are you with me? How many scriptures do we have? Mary being tormented by all of her enemies. All of her critics, I'd say less than one. Jesus being homeless, just only a handful of scriptures. Yet he owned it all. Isaiah 53, and we all need this scripture. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground, and he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised 
and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as if it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs. Carried our sorrows. Listen, all of those things were going to be a part of our music. They're going to be a part of our lives. But they are not the important part. All of us are going to have trouble. So does the world. All of us are going to have sorrows. So does the world. All of us are going to be grief stricken. So does the world. But the difference is he's in our boat. I don't know how people face whatever they face without God. I, I, I just have to be honest with you. What some people face, I don't understand how they get through it without God. Are you with me? You can get down on your knees and pray. Not through a preacher, but you can pray. You can pray. And, it, and sometimes your, your prayers don't feel like they hit the ceiling. Sometimes it feels like the clouds are wide open and you're talking to God himself. And you get a warm, tingly sen- sensation and you know everything's going to be okay. God hears. God hears. Every time you pray. There'll be times that you walk in here and you walk out feeling like you're in rapture. And there'll be times you walk in and you walk out. Well, I just must not have got what I needed to. What made the difference? It wasn't the preacher. It was you. And you can always look back and go, was I prepared? with me. Just hold that just for a few moments. I was a chimney chimney sweep. I actually started in 1989. And I started like everybody else. I just kind of started out just working, trying to pray the phone rang. And I went to a very large old house. It was a couple hundred years old. And I met a man there. And he was a skinny sort of fella. He was tall, skinny, had really dark eyes and really dark hair. And if I can just say it properly, he was a hippie type. And so he, he told me, he said, I want you to tell me exactly how these chimneys need to be restored in the right way. He said, now you may not be able to do it, and I'm, I'm really not expecting you to do it. But I'd like for you to clean my chimney and tell me exactly how to make them right back to where they were when they were built. And so I gave him some instructions, and he said, now, you know, I know you don't want to touch the brickwork or the mortar work, and you don't want to do that. You don't have the time to do that, and I understand. He said, but I need lids to put on top of these chimneys. You remember, his name was Barry Hop. And so I, uh, nothing wrong with my memory today. And so, so anyway, I, I gave him, I gave him a, an estimate of cost. And so... Brother Thomas, you know, sometimes you meet that customer and you go, they can't afford this. And so I began to talk to Barry and I said, now, this is going to cost pretty good money here. I said, and that day it was a couple thousand dollars. And so I said, we're just going to put lids on it and we're going to, we're going to put a vent cap that will go up and down. And so when you need a vent, you can open it up or you can, you can close it down. And you don't want it seen by the interstate going by you. And I said, Barry, can, can you afford this? He said, well, I, I think so. And I said, I said Barry, I, I hate to be, I hate to be uh, inquisitive in your affairs, but 
you know, when I get the work done, I, I need to know that you can afford this. I said, what do you do? He said, well, I'm, an, I'm a restorer. That's my job. I'm a restorer. I'm going somewhere. This goes with the sermon. Amen. And he said, I'm a restorer. He said, now, in restoration, you've got to bring it back to the way it was originally. And you gotta, you got to, the guy that built it, you've got to find out what his intricate details that he likes. And so you've got to go back and do it exactly like he did it. He said, let me show you a piece of artwork that I'm working on. And I walk in, and there's a piece of artwork, and it's a, it's a family sitting around a table, and there's, there's, there's fruit on the table. And it's, it's really nice, and it's got certain jugs on the table and certain things, and, and it's had some water damage. And, and he said, I have been assigned to restore this piece of art to where that it's like its original texture. And he, he began to explain something to you, and this will fit in his sermon. So he said, I got to figure out exactly and analyze this canvas, exactly what it's made of, and then I've got to find out exactly the, the, the ink that was used and the paint that was used, and i got to find the brush, and not just the brush, but the hairs have got to be exactly like that, and even the stem's got to be right, because i got to study the artist and his stroke, and I've got to stroke it exactly like he stroked it. And, I, and he said, now, now here's the, the detail of it. If I don't get the right texture, or if I don't get the right paint, or if I don't get the right stroke, and if I don't do it a certain way, and let it age a certain way, I mar the masterpiece. Amen. Now he said, for this piece of work, I, I'll get a million dollars. And I felt about that tall. Asking him for $2,000 for a piece of metal on the top of his roof. Amen. He said, Ron, I'd like for you to come and see this house when it's restored. So you can see my work. Two years later, they called us. And so I went back and there was, there was listen, and I'm going to say it lightly. There was probably 50 people there for open house. And I had an invitation. You had to have an invitation to go. I showed up in my red, because it was Christmas time, I showed up in my red Santa Claus chimney cleaning outfit. <laughs> and when I get there, I park where I'm supposed to park. And I'm greeted by the University of North Carolina, and Duke University is there. UVA is there. They have their representatives and in, in, in art and also in engineering, and, and they're all there. And I walk up a walkway that was not there before, but it is an elegant detail. And I walk up to a brand-new porch, and I walk up, I walk up to the door, and I walk in and sign in. And it don't look like the same house that I walked in two years ago. The sheetrock was made out of pig hair. Amen. And so he had to go get farmers that would take care of the pigs. And when they got ready to, to cut the pigs, they had to do it a certain way so the hair wasn't coat. And then he would mix it in the mud so it would... Be a certain way on the walls. Amen. And you know, at the end of it, this really struck me. And he came over and asked me, he said, how you like it? I said, I, I feel like I've stepped back in time. He said, that's exactly where you need to feel. Amen. You're standing 200 years ago. And friends have came over for the first time. And you're seeing the house. And he said, Ron, if you'll remember the conversation that we had when we first met. He said, you remember that piece of artwork? He said, I don't have the right to sign my name at the bottom of it. He said, I have restored this house. 
to the original builder. And he said, nowhere will you find my name. Nowhere will you find my name attached to how I built it. I had to do it exactly the way it ought to be done. Oh, God, help us as ministers. Oh, God, help us as a people sitting here at Full Gospel Lighthouse Tabernacle. It wasn't built for the kingdom of Homer Frazier. It wasn't built for the kingdom of Ron Spencer. It wasn't built for the kingdom. God, help us. This is what I think this ought to be done. And this is how I think the church ought to be run. Who cares? Who cares? Well, don't preach this part of the message. I got news for you. You're not my boss. book I believe every quote in this message but God's not coming back for this book he's not coming back for our tape libraries and our books and our pictures on the wall listen the three squirrels they will not be raptured the 42 inch caribou will not be raptured the silver-tipped grizzly bear will not be raptured. Blondie, that was Brother Branham's favorite gun, will go through the tribulation period. The rock that had an eagle in it, and they tore that out, will have to go through a restoration to be in the new world to come. So will me and you. We gotta be washed by the water of the word. Now I wanna just, can I go just a few more minutes? Every one of us around the world, whether you're a church of five, 10 or 10,000. We're all a body. Whether you sit in the first chair or the 15th chair, you got to take time to know the material. You can't show up at the symphony and there's the place to learn the message. Well, let's just think about this just for a little while. 3,000 people are coming to watch. The average ticket is $119. And they ask you to wear formal attire to just come to listen. There's no chatter. They even have instructions. You think we're tough here? You think we're tough here? They have specific instructions. If your baby cries out, immediately move the child and get it into. Listen, I just listened to your children crying. I know you'll do the right thing. But I hear growth in this church. We sat at Weese's the other day. Yeah, we go to Weese's. We sat at Weese's the other day, and there was a minister sitting there, and he was talking to somebody across, and he didn't know we were preachers at all. And he said he was sitting there, and he said, our church is dead. He said, we laid off two preachers. He said, we've laid off the the youth pastor because we have absolutely no youth. Our church is dying. And he said, we're working ourselves out of a job. I'll tell you why. He don't have life. (laughs) 
They don't have life. I'll tell you what's going on here. It's life. Life. Life is happening. That's why there's amens and shouting hallelujah and praising God and worshiping God and music. Are you with me? But listen, that don't start at church. Musicians, I want to talk to you. Take time at home to get to know the author of the book. Let him come into your room in that warm presence. Pray. Read your Bible. Listen to the word. Here's some words I wanted you to pray. Father, forgive me. I want you to pray these words. I surrender myself to you. Not to a man, but I surrender myself. Jesus, use me. Jesus, use me. Now, so many times we're distracted. I'm sorry, I'm just going to take a few more minutes. We're distracted because it's the enemy's job to do. Every one of us are on different levels. Duh. We're all growing. How many's been here less than six months? Yeah. We're really glad to have you. We're really glad to have you. And if you're listening and you're tuning and you're you're listening, some of the musicians sitting beside of you, they're gonna hit the wrong note now and then. And they're going, every one of us are going through different things because it's called life. It's called life. It's called life. And so as we're going through, there's going to be some spots that you've got to overlook certain things. Am I with you? I'm just going to talk to you. It's kind of like your wife. When you first got married and she made gravy, it wasn't your mama's. Oh, come on. Bring it, if you got any brains between your ears, you do not bring up mama. She bakes biscuits for the first time, and they're that tall. They're harder than a baseball bat. Just put more jelly on it. Matthew says it, and it's worthy to be said. Shut that mouth. <laughs> now your goal is to have a lifelong marriage. Amen. Not to die and bury you next week. <laughs> so there's going to be some spots that you're going to see that are kind of imperfections. When she says, do I look big in this dress? Don't even breathe. (laughs) That requires another drink. What 
does that have to do with a symphony, Brother Ron? We're all together. We're not here to poke and fuss and be a cactus one to another. We're not here to have a lecture on what we don't like. You got to find common ground. Are you with me now? And above all things, love one another. The guy walking in, and he's paid $119 for his suit. He's got a bow tie on. I was tempted to wear a bow tie today. He brings his wife in in formal attire, and they have an assigned seat, 67A and 67B. You know, he don't know who's sitting beside of him. He don't know what their job is. But they all have a like. They like orchestra. They're not there to have a conversation about how many kids they got, what kind of car they drive. They came to the orchestra. Some of those seats are as much as $1,100. If you're sitting in a $1,100 seat and you're sitting there and you've got a blabbermouth sitting beside of you, Brother Ron, you ever been there? Yeah. I was actually, it wasn't your turn. (laughs) I was actually on a plane one day, and I was actually sitting listening. And I was listening to this. (laughs) And this guy was telling me his life story. I was sitting in first class. and, And he was just rattling off. He was drinking little bottles about that big. And it was making him talk. And finally, I said, you, I, I, I said, sir, I just need to talk to you a minute. We're on a 13-hour trip. I said, I need to talk to you a minute. I paid extra to sit in this seat. This seat will lay back, and I can go to sleep. But I will not be able to accomplish that with your mouth. Well, Brother Ron, that was rude. I have a rule. I hurt your feelings once or I have to hurt them later. What did he do? He shut that mouth. (laughs) And for the next 12 hours, I was able to rest. Are you with me? So you show up at the symphony. And all of a sudden, that ain't what we came for. That ain't what we came for. There's a guy. Where you hide them sticks? <laughs> I can play this. Well, I can't see, but I can play this. I picked two of the same. It's pretty incredible. And there's a guy who comes out, and there's, there's generally about an hour prep right before People come out, they warm themselves up. Call it, what do you call it, warming the lips. And they start ready to, ready to play and they're getting ready. And you know, it sounds like a bunch of nonsense. It, you, know, you know, all of these people are warming up and warming up and you think, what in the world is going to go on here? And I paid this money to sit here and they're, they're all, they come into their places, and some comes a little different times than others. And they all come to their place. And the leader will begin to make sure that all of his group's in line. The guy with the triangle, the guy, the guy in the back with the drums. Most generally, there's several sets of drums. All of them have certain characteristics that they play with. But the guy comes out in the tuxedo. Most of the time, they got bushy hair. I don't know what that deal is, but... As a guy comes out, I let mine grow, I'd be bushy. He comes out and he gets a stick. And that stick absolutely means something. Amen. If you're part of the players, it absolutely means something. And every time he moves it in a certain way, it's designed to do certain things, to bring certain emphasis on certain music. And 
then he begins to bring it forth. He will turn and introduce himself to the audience. It's not about him. He has selected now 300 people from all over the world. They are the best of the best. This is not the day that you practice. I'm winding up now. This is not the day that you practice. This is the day that you're at your best. The background story don't matter whatsoever. The weather outside don't matter whatsoever. Today, this song is about when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. And he begins to wave his sticks and he'll take you from deity of Jesus Christ all the way through communion. And no matter how long you've been in the symphony, it's as fresh to you as the first time you heard it. And why does that director get so excited? Why does he get so excited? Because he has been inspired by the music. He knows how it needs to sound. He knows I have gathered the best of the best of the best. And now they have come at peak efficiency. And it's not about one, it's about 300. We're going to bring this to life. If I could name a few names now, William Branham is standing just beyond the realm. And this message was not just to be in tape and book form. It's to be in human vessels. To overcome in Laodicea. Not to be diminished or to be diluted or to be watered down. It's Jesus Christ in every one of us. Six-year-old, 14 years old, 21 years old, 90 years old. I got good news for you. We're going to overcome. We're not waiting on a man to direct it. The Holy Ghost is here. The Holy Ghost is here. So, Brother Randall, when we come to a difficult spot in the music, it isn't the music that's wrong. It's we. So we pray that our attitude will change. Because the music's not going to change. And remember this, how important you are. It wasn't you chose God. It wasn't you chose God. God chose you. I want that to settle in. I'm going to take one more minute if I can. When I was a little bitty boy, I was four years old, when we walked by a casket in Jeffersonville, Indiana. My daddy told me that William Branham is a prophet. We went to the Jeffersonville meetings every Easter to listen to a tape until 1977. There was a certain year that we went and we didn't have a place to sit in the building. And I was about 11 years old and Doc Branham, he loved dad. And he said, would you, would you, would you, feel, would you feel okay if we sit in the, in the baptistry? 
big white baptistry. And dad took me around. Mark stayed with mom. And so dad walked me around and we went down the steps and sat in the baptistry. Now here's how things work. I was sitting in the baptistry and there's a curtain right in front of me and we heard the prophet speak by tape. And sitting directly where that curtain come together was an 18-year-old boy that I would later meet as an older man. And his name was Tim Pruitt. And all the other meetings that he had went to, preachers sat on the platform. So when he walks in, he thinks it's his thing to do is to go up and sit on the platform. So he goes and sits on the platform. And he sits right in the crease of that curtain. And sitting behind him in the baptistry was an 11-year-old boy named Ron Spencer. We were in the same symphony. How old are you, Chaz? 49. You're going to be an old gal next year. <laughs> she won't get offended. But I want you to just think, in a matter of a few minutes, everything changed in your life. Everything changed. What will it be like, Brother Ron, when the resurrected saints come back? They can't wait till we finish. And we can't wait till we see them. Brother Ron, how are we ever going to get all these things figured out? Don't worry. Just keep playing the symphony. Just keep playing once on the music. Okay to tell the story. I'm over time now. Stephen went to Brother Josh's Bennett's place. When I walked in Brother Josh's office last year when I was helping preach his meeting, Brother Josh has a man in his church that bills. He bills for, uh, a certain style of furniture. He puts a deer head in it, a piece of metal. He puts all different kind of things in it. And I was just awed. I, I couldn't hardly look at the brothers by looking at this piece of art. And this man had quit his job to take care of his wife, who's now an invalid. And to make extra money, not in some great big building, but in his yard, he creates masterpiece work. I want you to go get that knife. The knife it's sitting on. It's actually, it's in a box now. I boxed it up. And I just said, boy, that's beautiful. That's an incredible thing. Josh said, would you like for him to build you one? I said, oh, I couldn't ask for something like that. That's a masterpiece. He went down. He had ulterior motives, but he went down. And he called me the other day, wanted to, called Andrew and said, can I come by your house? I got something for Brother Ron. I had no idea what he, what he was bringing. I didn't even know where you went. Shame on you, you're supposed to tell me. And, and so anyway, he, he says, Brother Ron, and I go out to greet him. I thought maybe he's going to give me some coffee. And I go out to greet him, and, and he, he begins to pull this piece out. And it's, maybe I'll bring a picture in a couple of weeks. And it's a picture of a, it's, it's, a, it's an artwork of a deer, 10-point deer. And on the top of that 10-point deer is a mouse. And it's all made out of metal. And I mean, these animals look alive. The deer's a carcass, but, but all of them look alive. And there's a snake at the bottom, rattlesnake, slithering. And there's a tree that's there. And on the top of the tree, it's one of the most pe beautiful pieces of wood that were put together. It was trash wood. trash wood that he took and made new again. 
You'd have thought it was a piece of art. And then there's this snake on the, on, on the bottom. And this deer head laid over like this. And on the top of the deer head, there's a mouse. And then there's a tree of life that is holding this piece of wood up. I said, well, there's got to be a story to this. Now, here's a man taking care of his wife that must be taken care of. He's quit his job, a good-paying job, to be able to take care of his wife. And in the time that he can, he builds these masterpieces, works of art. And I'm that mouse on that, on that, on that deer head, that antler. I'm that mouse on that antler. And that snake can't get to me because I'm too close to the tree of life. What that man did, the music of his life sets in my living room as a masterpiece. And you know what the key of it is? I don't even know what the man looks like. I've never shook his hand, but I've seen his work. Last night, this was brought to me in the back room. You mind if I just tell a couple more stories? Your roast won't burn too bad. Brother Jonathan, that likes charity, Siler, Sister Connie helps me talk. He wanted to do something special for me, so he got a knife made by a company called Black Mamba. And it's supposed to be a very special metal. And they made this knife especially for me. Jonathan didn't bring it, but he sent it. Has a really nice display case that goes with it. Jonathan was here in our prayer line last year, and God touched his life. So he wanted to do something special. And Gabriel thought it was a special knife. So being a special knife, it wasn't going to be used on deer and bear and turkey. Hadn't had much luck with turkey. So he put the cloud on the knife. And that makes it even more special. The reason I'm telling you that is Jonathan didn't come and deliver it himself. He sent it like God sent his word. And whether you see him or whether you feel him, it's a masterpiece. And when God showed us a vision of coming here to be the pastor... He didn't show me you as a crowd. He just, and I I didn't know these boys would be working with me. But all I knew was, it was God's purpose and plan. And if I'm to be in this part of the symphony, I want to do the best job that I know how to do. I've told you about a chair, and I, I told you about the masterpiece of that work. And I've showed you this. Boy, I bet that means a lot to you, Brother Ron. Yeah, it does. You was in my office yesterday, Brother Marcus. And there's a basket that's got a, got a policeman's outfit with a badge and with a gun. And a hat. And it's, it's in that basket. Now it didn't look like much to you. No doubt it's just thrown down in there. There's a fireman's outfit. And there's a nurse's outfit that's in there. You know where I'm going. Come here Isaac. Isaac. 
Oh, come on, Zoe, come on. No, she ain't coming. (laughs) But this is the guy that brings that policeman and fire truck and race cars and baseball and soccer and football. Them deer on the wall, they won't move. I'm doing something. I'm finishing. But this guy brings all of that to life. They're shooting and houses being. A ball that was on the floor all of a sudden is coming at me at 25 miles an hour. Catch it, Paw Paw. I see two balls, so I got to aim. I got to. There's books on that shelf back there. The message is on most of your phones. The greatest trophy that God has. Brother Doug, that's how special you are in the symphony. God couldn't take you too early. We still needed you. Let's stand to our feet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you enjoy that? Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, Welcome to the symphony. called up yonder, I'll be there.